Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks very much for joining. Hopefully you can uh, see see the screen at the moment and hear, hear us. Um, so tonight we're just going to, um, in this webinar, we're going to hear from Rosie, who uh, founded a charity in memory of her father, who died of a brain tumour um, a a, over a decade ago now. Um, and then we'll be hearing from Will, who's a trustee of the Brain Tumour Charity, about his experiences living with brain tumour. And finally, oh no, sorry, not finally, then we'll pass on to Todd and he's going to talk about his experiences rowing the Atlantic for uh, raising money for brain tumours. And finally, we'll hear from Dr. Spencer Watson, whose research project in Switzerland, the Brain Tumour Charity and Brian Cross Memorial Trust are jointly supporting. Rosie, over to you. Aha, uh -huh, here we are. Thank you, Becky. Um, so just to give you a brief overview of um, the Brian Cross Memorial Trust. So in 2006, my um, dad passed away from a brain tumor in his brainstem. And um, I was 16 at the time. And I, I don't remember much. I actually think I probably blocked out quite a lot of it. But I do remember the feeling of utter hopelessness when we found that there was nothing more that could be done for him. Uh, with his treatment and then as we looked at this kind of more we discovered that this was often a feeling that families were faced with and that's due to the lack of um, funding and research in this area so we decided to set up a charity in his name with the ambition to fund research and um, give back hope to all of those families um, that have a brain tumor diagnosis so over the last um, 14 years now, um, alongside family and friends, we're so proud uh, to say that the trust has raised uh, a staggering one million pounds. And that's actually been down to lots of um, lots of events, sort of balls and clay pigeon shoots and marathons and Ironmen. And we've really been blown away by all the support we've had and also obviously most recently Todd's Atlantic Row that you'll hear more about later. Um, during the uh, time that we've had the charity up and running we it's been amazing to me how many people we've met and come across that have been affected by brain tumours. Um, I'm always a bit baffled because it's deemed really rare but I, you know, I've met so many families and um, it makes me feel really proud to be a part of this charity. And we you know we have always committed to funding research that has the biggest impact and ensuring that every penny goes towards research. So um, the way I thought you might want to sort of understand a bit of how we work. So we typically partner with other charities that have got um, the research expertise to help us shortlist some high quality projects. And then uh, I'm very privileged as one of the trustees alongside Becky, who just gave the introduction and Will, Todd and my husband, Alex now, um, to then pick the project that we want to support. And really excitingly, you're going to hear a lot more about that later from Dr. Um, Spencer Watson. And um, I just wanted to say as well that although the charity is, is in dad's name, it really is for everyone that um, is going through something like this. And it's, um, you know, brain tumors affect more young people than any other cancer. And so it's been, that was sort of, highlighted with um, when dad was at Adam Brooks and one of the reasons why we really decided that this was an area that we wanted to dedicate probably the rest of our lives to um, help find a cure and um, I'm very proud that we are partnering with the Brain Tumor Charity. I was lucky enough to work there for a year and saw um, firsthand the amazing work that they do and not just research, but um, raising awareness because an early diagnosis is absolutely key um, and also support for families, um, which is often really needed. So um, 
I hopefully you'll, you'll have some questions and things that will come to at the end, but that was just sort of um, a brief overview. And I'm really proud uh, to say that Will will be talking about his um, story next. So I'm gonna hand over to Will. Good evening all. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and Rosie, it's so nice to hear from you just because it's it's always nice to hear from someone who's been affected by it and how you know how passionate and confident you are in delivering that message. So, so thanks. Um, but but first and foremost, I, I just think thank you everyone for being here tonight and just for the continued support, you know, the time that people put aside for you know reading all the emails about upcoming events, you know, cheering us on. And of course, the, the huge generosity of, of donations that's been made. Um, and it's, it's through that generosity that we've been able to fund some research projects through the Brain Tumor Charity. And today, of course, that, that um, Spencer, uh, Dr. Dr. Watson, is, is going to tell us about the very exciting new project that we've decided to fund. Um, but it is, and, and Rosie's touched on this, but it, it, the key takeaway for me is the importance of continuing this support into the future to improve the treatment of brain tumours. And it is, it is a case of it's raising that awareness and putting the funding together to invest in the R&D needed uh, to improve the treatment. Um, so I've, um, I was diagnosed in 2015 with a, with a brain tumour. And I, I really have just been overwhelmed by the, the passion for those that have been that have been impacted. And, and Rosie is an illustration of that. Um, it, it, it is uh, the biggest cancer killer of, of under 40s. And that fact is just it's really not widely known. And I've been I've been lucky enough to have the, the Brian Cross Memorial Trust as a platform for me to put my energy into and, and you know bang the drum of that awareness and try and grow the community and it's through you know events like this and um events that that we've all done as as trustees and um that, that we we're able to, to to grow the community and, and raise that awareness um so yeah so back in june 2015 uh, after hitting my head from a fall i had a ct scan uh, then an MRI to confirm I had a brain tumour and then that so that tumour was found in the left frontal lobe so around about there um, and therefore it's it's it was easily operational and with any of these things they with with a brain tumour if they can operate they want to as soon as possible so my surgery was booked in for the for the following month and I was, you know, in recovery and a, you know, a huge shock, shock to my system um, within a within within a month. So um, it's yeah, it was it was pretty hard. But I was lucky enough to know Rosie, who was a good friend. Who um, I, was, I was at university with Rosie, and she was working at the Brain Tumor Charity at the time. And through that, I. I was able to, she passed on huge amounts of information and I was able to go to events and actually meet other patients. And it was meeting other patients that I just realized how fortunate I've been to not only find it from a sort of freak accident at an early stage, uh, but also because it was operational and that I've been able to, uh, to recover to a relative normality. Um, and it, it really shocked me meeting these other patients, just how impacted they've, they had been, but you know, mentally and physically, because they had that their treatment was um, was due to finding the tumor late or in a location that, you know, in some cases is not operational. So um, in in lots of cases, it's not easy to diagnose a brain tumor. You know, you either get headaches or you have seizures or you see behavioural change. Um, and, you know, this does lead to limited treatment options. And, um, you know, I, I think for me, it's important to raise that awareness and also to try and solve that um, through 
uh, the likes of, of funding and, 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 and raising, um, raising funds to invest in, in the research needed. Um, and it, it really shows just how poor the funding is currently um, in term for the for the research into improving the, the, the treatments. Um, and in some ways, actually, just how just political it, it, it was. Because um, for me, and I, I'm sure for many, actually, it wasn't until, you know, the likes of Tessa Jowell's diagnosis or you may have seen the press in the last in the last couple of years, like John Newman and Tom Parker, who are apparently famous singers. Um, and then actually very recently, Paul Ritter, who was an actor who um, who died from a from a brain tumour. And it's 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 through this you actually see how common it is, but how little um, how, how, how little is known about it. Um, but but meeting up these other patients really just you know showed me how I, I, I did feel like a slight imposter actually, just because I had recovered so well. And so for me, I really want to show what's what's possible post craniotomy and you know push the boundaries where I can. Because I, you know, after recovering, I've returned to a, a, a pretty busy job. I returned to my job at the time in 20, um, 2015, working for an accounting practice. I finished my accounting qualification, and then I was able to, about a year later, um, to finish an Ironman, raising money for for the Brian Cross Memorial Trust. And you know, I, I continue to try and push myself in in other events um, where I can. But because I've been able to return to an amazing life, I'm, I am still a patient. You know, the threat of another tumour growth is always around the corner. And unfortunately for me, that, that did happen. I had a regrowth a year after, just over a year after my first surgery. And uh, in December 2017, I had another craniotomy. Now, the second craniotomy... And well, first I've got to say, a second craniotomy is a lot worse than the first. Um, but the second left me with epilepsy, so it means I can't drive. I've got to be careful with um, drinking alcohol and making sure I get enough sleep, which I think is just a lesson for, for everyone, I think, rather than just me. Um, but interestingly, the biopsy from my second surgery actually came back to be largely scar tissue which in, uh, in the case of what Dr. Watson is going to speak about later, which is the research into glial scars and, and, the, associate, and the association with tumour growth. Um, so, but I, I will let him talk about the science. I, I, I um, won't get into too much, but it, it just shows you how it's, um, it's, it's how, how at the forefront of research that, um, Dr. Watson's um, research is, is, is going to be, and it's only just kicking off. So um, it'd be very interesting to hear from him about it. But my treatment is now a, a watch and wait. I have scans every three months, uh, one tomorrow, in fact, uh, to monitor to monitor all growth. Um, but I'm also about to start a clinical trial of a new drug to um, that stops growth. It's to do with a particular um, cell hormone that I have um, that they're trying to um, that they're trying to test and um, and and stop tumor growth, but this again it just highlights the, the um, how early in the the stage the, the research stage the treatment of brain tumors are and the importance of continuing that support. Um, and so it's it's just uh, I just again thank you so much all of you for um, the support and please please stay with us and um, get involved in any events that you want to get in touch with us if you want to raise money or or join in any of the, of the events that that we're doing so um, yeah thank you so much um, but now on to the main event and the reason we're all here tonight, which is to speak to 
Todd Hooper about his Atlantic row. So I'm going to ask him a few questions. Firstly, Todd, how are you? I'm good, thanks, Will, and uh, well, thanks for well, thanks for sharing your story with us. Oh well, pleasure. You're looking very, very well. It must be. Uh, it must be. It's been. It's been three months now since I got back, so I've uh, I've put on a bit of weight and I've I've had a, a haircut and a beard trim. So yeah, I can assure you, I I didn't look quite like this in on the 17th of January when I arrived in Antigua. Yeah, well, I haven't quite got there with the lockdown haircut yet. But, uh, it's uh yeah well it took Todd absolutely amazing um what you've done um for, for those that don't really know about what you've done can you just give us a, a bit of a highlight as to you know what is the row um yeah yeah absolutely so um the the race that that I took part in with uh with my team or our team last year 35 uh, is called the Talisker Whiskey Atlantic Challenge it's a 3000 mile uh, unsupported row which uh, takes place every year it's an annual race um it starts in Lagomera in the Canary Islands uh, which is an island just off Tenerife and it finishes um, 3,000 miles later in uh, the Caribbean, uh, in Antigua. Typically, 30 to 40 teams take part each year. Um, last year, given, given COVID and, and the challenges that that posed, uh, there were 22 teams that took place um, in the race. And yeah, pleased to say that all, all 22 um, arrived in, in Antigua. Um, we arrived uh, 36 days and five hours uh, after we left um, on the 12th of December. We were the third boat um, to arrive in, in Antigua and the second in the race category. So there were there are two categories. There's the open class, which which any type of boat can enter. And then there's the race class, which is specific to the type of boat that, that we raced in, which is a it's a Rannoch, um, a Rannoch built boat. Um, so we came second in the race category, third boat um, out of all the boats that the road. Um, rowing an ocean isn't is not something that I've always dreamt of doing. Um, I rode as a as a schoolboy when I was 12, 13 years old with Alex, actually one of the one of the other trustees. Um, but other than that, you know, I've got a, a, a kind of brief um, and amateur background in, in endurance sports. Um, and so, you know, I, I love testing myself kind of mentally and, and physically. Um, Dixon uh, McDonald, he was my friend and colleague at the time um, where where I work and where he used to work. Um, he, he approached me to be part of uh, the team that he was putting together. Um, and I said yes, pretty quickly, thankfully. Thank you. I have a very understanding fiance in Ellie and and my boss uh, is is also very supportive. But uh, yeah, so I was, feel very privileged and lucky to have been able to take kind of two months outside of work uh, to go and go and row row across an ocean. Um, and I, I'm also feel very privileged to have to have done it to support um, the Brian Cross Memorial Trust. Um, you know, I think when I started this journey, the the primary reason for doing it was to row an ocean and was 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 a personal one to, to be frank um but it felt like a you know an amazing opportunity to raise not just raise funding but also to raise awareness for for brain tumor research um and brain tumors as a whole um and it was a it was a huge motivation for me um whilst whilst i was going through you know the the ordeals day in day out um which you know, it was uh, knowing that my suffering was was only temporary, but hopefully was um, in aid of the charity and, and and helping people going through uh, you know much more difficult challenges than I than I was. Well, yeah. So, so how much did you raise in the end? So, in total, um, the total to date is one hundred and fifty one thousand pounds. So, yeah, phenomenal amount, and and it's it's thanks to. Um, so, you know everyone on this call and and, and lots of friends um, family and colleagues so yeah it's um it's 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 great it's a good start but uh, but as rosie said uh, we haven't finished so um there'll be more to come yeah incredible so so come on give us give us the highlights of um I, i'm more interested in in, in the worst but um, i'm going <laughs> to other than finishing, so fit, I mean, for sure, finishing um, and arriving in in Antigua um, to see friends and family was was a huge highlight, um, and yeah, that kind of sense of elation is something that I'll I'll never forget. Um, 
on the worst side of things, um, on day three, we had a full power failure, um, which we we nicknamed Black Tuesday. Um, so I was I was rowing. Uh, it was about five o'clock in the morning, so it was still dark, and we were in some pretty big conditions, kind of 20 feet of swell. Um, and suddenly, all the power failed, and our, our, our auto helm stopped working. Um, I had to wake Jimmy up. Jimmy always seemed to be asleep when something went wrong, so I was constantly waking him up in a in a state of chaos. And he was, you know, naked in the cabin in in the fetal position. So, um, yeah, that which was uh, always very interesting. But we we had to spend six hours rewiring the batteries in the middle of the ocean um, to get back on our way. And it was kind of day three, and we already thought that potentially the the whole race was over after nearly two years of, of preparation. Um, we had some pretty big storms, both. Well, one on Christmas Eve and one on uh, New Year's Eve, uh, which they were, you know, we had 30 to 40 mile an hour winds, um, 20 feet swells, kind of big waves, um, you know, crashing over the boat. Um, and they, they both lasted for between six and 24 hours, one of them. So, um, yeah, they were, they were probably the, the worst days. Um, we we had we had a couple of good days. I'll be honest, looking back on it, you know, the 36 days that it took, there's probably only two that I look back and think they were great days. Um, one was day six, which we nicknamed Good Friday. Uh, we were visited by a pod of nearly a thousand dolphins uh, for for almost an hour, kind of swimming next to the boats, jumping up through waves in pairs and trios, and it was just an incredible moment, kind of being in the middle of the ocean, you know, fantastic weather waves and, and being surrounded by, by all these uh, dolphins, which was, yeah, an, an incredible time. Um, and then I should probably also mention the Marlin attack. So on, I think it was day 26, we had about 10 days remaining, a thousand nautical miles, um, and we got attacked by a Marlin. Um, it felt like being in a car crash. Uh, the Marlin hit us from the side of the boat, came under through the water. I thought it was a, a shark that had attacked us initially. Um, and yeah, the, the, the bill of the marlin uh, came through the hull and actually threw into our cabin, um, pierced uh, the this very thin mattress that we, that we had in there. And it missed, again, Jimmy was asleep. Um, it missed uh, his leg by about an inch. Um, so then we had to spend six hours repairing the hole and pumping water out of the cabin uh, and, and got on our way. So yeah, it was um, quite an intense uh, 36 days with, with some pretty big ups and downs, but yeah, I look back on it, um, you know, fondly. Yeah, great. And when you, when you look back at the race and uh, I'm sure you've had time to reflect now, what do you think you've learned from, from, doing, from doing this? Certainly to appreciate the the simple things in life. Um, it's amazing how much you'll miss, uh, you know, a warm shower or a bed. Um, you know, clearly you, you miss your friends and family a lot, but yeah, the simple things in life, um, I think, I, I, you know, I need to remind myself constantly to, to appreciate those. Um, I think also whilst, you know, I knew it was going to be one of the hardest things that I'd ever done, both physically and mentally, it was, it was truly a lot harder than I, than I could ever have imagined. Um, and I think, you know, looking back on it, you know, it's, it's amazing what, what, you know, the human body and the human mind is, is capable of. Um, so I think, yeah, I think everyone should, should be, you know, should know that they're capable probably of more than, than they're, than they're aware of. Um, and then the other thing that I, that I learned about myself or in general is that nothing nothing lasts forever you know whether that's good or, or bad um you know the day with the dolphins i mean it didn't last for very long so i think you have to appreciate uh the good times when when you're having them and equally the bad times so when we were in the middle of big storms or we had the marlin attack to deal with um you know just knowing that that those bad things will subside and that the time will pass and, and things will get better uh, and i think that's probably true of you know, life, not just of time uh, in, in the middle of the ocean. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Um, okay, so so you mentioned you had two years of preparation. So so what were the sorts of things that you were doing before, before um, starting the event? 
From a training perspective, um, we we tried to spend as much time as we could in the boat, uh, which was challenging because Dixon was based in New York and, and the rest of us, Jono and Jimmy and myself, were, were here in, in the UK. So in any, nord in any ordinary year, we would have spent uh, as much time as possible together in the boat. Now, clearly, travel was was somewhat challenging last year. So, so we didn't get to spend as much time together in the boat. Um, so we did a lot of virtual, a lot of virtual yoga and virtual um, Pilates together. We um, obviously trained pretty hard in the gym. Uh, we had a strength and conditioning coach, a guy called Gus Barton, who specializes in, in ocean rowing. Um, and we also tried to, um, I guess, prepare ourselves mentally. Uh, we had a, you know, a lot of honest conversations with each other about things that we thought would go well, things that we thought wouldn't, things that we thought might get on each other's nerves for, for, um, for grown men on a 28 foot boat for, for a month. I think you have to be um, very honest and, and, and open with each other. Um, so yeah, and then of course there were a number of safety courses we had to do um we yeah and we had to raise money not just to, to fund the row but also you know we'd spent a lot of time uh raising money for our respective charities so it was a busy uh a busy 18 months two years leading up to the race yeah yeah well absolutely incredible todd um thank you so much for for sharing that it's it's been love hearing about it um but we have to hand over to um spencer watson now who is going to take us through the um, the new project that the Brian Cross Memorial Trust has just funded, so um, which everyone's looking forward to. So, yeah, yeah, thanks so much. Here, let me just um, share my slides. <clears throat> there we go. Can you see that? Okay. Okay. So. Um, Hi everyone, uh, thanks so much for having me today and for really everything you do for raising money. I will say that it's really gonna be hard to follow Todd's talk because that was just so impressive. Um, I'm gonna do my best to make this at least half as exciting. Uh, I know we're at least excited about this research. So I'm a Future Leaders postdoctoral fellow in the lab of Professor Joanna Joyce at the University of Lausanne, which is in Switzerland, as you can tell from my super realistic Zoom background. And the Joyce Lab focuses on some really groundbreaking therapies that specifically target the microenvironment of brain tumors. And I'm gonna show some of my ongoing project that studies how anti-cancer treatments can cause scarring in the brain and how these scars may actually be promoting tumor recurrence. So uh, this work focuses on glioblastoma, which is arguably one of the worst types of cancer. And what makes this such a horrible disease is it's so difficult to treat. Um, it's that it's so adaptable to many kinds of treatments that we would use. So the standard treatments are chemotherapy and radiation and surgery. And these work for a time, um, but these tumors do always uh, tend to grow back. So there's a really desperate need for new kinds of more effective treatments. But these can sometimes take a long time to actually bring to the clinic. So a point I'll try to make in this talk is that we also need to find new ways to improve the current therapies that we already have. So what we do in, in the Joyce lab is instead of targeting the really elusive and adaptable tumor cells, is we go after the more stable cells surrounding the tumor, like immune cells, which we call the tumor microenvironment. Um, because one of the worst tricks that cancer plays on the body is that it can corrupt these otherwise healthy cells and recruit them to help the tumor grow. So our lab looks at ways to reprogram immune cells and turn them back into cells that will attack the tumor. And one of the ways we do this is to use small molecule drugs that target corrupted cells that are called tumor-associated macrophages and block their pro-tumor behavior. And this is work uh, Joanna's lab previously published in Science, where they treated an, an animal model of glioblastoma with these macrophage targeted drugs, and then tracked the response to the tumor with mouse scaled MRI. And these drugs were able to really dramatically shrink even large tumors down to small dormant lesions. But what they also saw is about half of these tumors eventually grew back under treatment. And what was actually really interesting about this is that every single time a tumor grew back, it always recurred next to a glial scar that had formed during the treatment. 
And so this led us to hypothesize that these scars, they're not just a byproduct of the treatment. They were actually helping the tumor regrow. And that if we could block the scar from forming, we could potentially stop these tumors from regrowing. And just to tell you a little bit about what glial scarring is. So this is how the brain responds to traumatic brain injuries, like in car accidents or sports injuries. And it involves a wound healing program that creates dense fibrous tissue that is meant to stop the spread of further damage. But glial scars are in general still not very well understood. And we really know next to nothing about their role in cancer. So there are some potential links. We do have some evidence to suggest that uh, severe glial scarring can actually lead to glioblastoma in extremely rare cases. But nothing is known about how these scars form in response to glioblastoma treatment. So we used MRI and microscopic fluorescent imaging to track how these scars form during macrophage-targeted treatment. And we could see how following treatment, the tumors uh, completely shrunk away. But in its place, there were these dark black regions in the image. And whenever the tumor grew back, it was always right next to these regions, which we could see were made of dense fibrous proteins like collagens. And what was actually so striking about these imaging studies was that the only place we could find tumor cells after treatment was embedded in the densest parts of the scar. So this really strongly suggested that glial scars were potentially serving as a protective niche, a place for surviving tumor cells to hide out and escape treatment. And then when conditions are right, they can escape from these structures and regrow into the brain. And we also performed a lot of additional studies uh, with other anti-cancer treatments, more standard treatments like radiation and surgical removal of the tumor. And really importantly, we found more or less the same scarring response to all these treatments. So it seems as if any treatment that aggressively perturbs the tumor microenvironment has the potential to trigger the scarring response that we see is potentially linked to tumor recurrence. And so far, most of these findings have been in animal models, but we're also actively coordinating with neurosurgeons all over the world to obtain samples from human patients who have had tumors recur after treatment, such as this case here, where we're seeing extensive scarring in a tumor that regrew after standard treatment. But these kinds of matched samples are really hard to come by. And so I'd just like to take a moment to say, this is why we're so grateful to patients who consent for their data and their biopsies to be used for research. We just simply could not do meaningful work without the invaluable contributions of patients and patient advocates. It's just really so important to everything we do. And so now, if glial scars really are a good potential target to improve therapeutic response, the problem is we know next to nothing about them. We don't fully understand how they form, and we don't even really know what they're made of. So we undertook a large scale project to very meticulously isolate tumors and scars during treatment to analyze what proteins comprise these regions as they form. And I do need to point out that this would not have been possible without contributions of other talented scientists in the Joyce lab. Uh, in particular, Drs. Sina Nasiri and Anuk Zomer, who is also an equal contributor to this project. And we used a technique called mass spec proteomics to determine the proteins that were present in each of the samples and identified over 4,000 different unique proteins. And then we used computational techniques to identify the biological processes these proteins were involved in. Um, let's see if I can get the slides to advance here. There we go. Um, yes, and one of the main pathways we found was wound healing and fibrosis pathways that could potentially be targets for drugs to inhibit the formation of scars. But when we're identifying these proteins, we essentially mash up the sample before analysis. So we have no idea where in the tumor these different, um, where in the tumor microenvironment all these processes are taking place, which is really vital to know so that we can narrow down the best possible drug candidates. And this kind of brings us to another problem, which is that normal microscopic imaging of tumors really doesn't tell us enough. It mostly looks like a chaotic bunch of nonsense. So we want to see patterns and order in a tumor. We need to be able to see a lot more at the same time and in the same tissue. So we developed a process specifically for brain tumors that allows us to take many pictures of the same tumor where each color is a different aspect of the tumor and then combine them. So instead of a, a normal three channel image like this one, 
we instead create a single image with 40 to 50 channels. And this allows us to look at the entire tumor area and then zoom in with microscopic resolution so we can see all of the different uh, tumor cell types, immune cell types, the different uh, structures and proteins. You can see the nerves and blood vessels. And this creates a really unprecedented deep view of brain tumors. And while this is really powerful, in some ways it's actually too much. A human can't possibly see all of this at once and take full advantage of this data. So what we do is train machine learning and deep learning computational algorithms to detect every cell and then measure everything they can about the cells, including where the cells are in relation to other cell types and also where they are in relation to the, the larger structures in the tumor, like leaky blood vessels. And this allows the computer to see what we can't, to find order and patterns in the chaos of a tumor. So our goal then is to use these data to identify therapeutics that can specifically target the scarring response of anti-cancer treatments. And if it's successful, could hopefully be a meaningful breakthrough in patient care. Um, and just to put this in a bit of historical perspective, it was back in 1858 that uh, Rudolf Erko first made the link between wound healing and cancer, calling it the wound that does not heal. And since then, this has come to really define how we look at a lot of other kinds of cancers. But this is the first study to our knowledge that has made the link between treatment-induced wound healing and tumor recurrence in brain cancer. So right now we have ongoing preclinical trials with these macrophage targeted drugs in combination with several drugs targeting different processes involved in scarring, such as uh, neuroinflammation, wound healing driven by astrogliosis, and injury-induced fibrosis. And any drug that succeeds in blocking scar formation in this context will then be used in combination with other more standard glioblastoma treatments like uh, radiotherapy and surgical resection. Because if the hypothesis is correct, if we can eliminate the scar as a protective niche for surviving tumor cells, we could potentially improve the response of patients to several kinds of brain cancer treatments. And hopefully we will be able to share the results of those studies soon. So with that, I'd just like to say that this whole project was also made possible by the fantastic team in the Joyce Lab, in particularly Joanna herself that built this team and has guided this project from the very start. And really ambitious projects like this require a great team. So I'd also like to give a special thanks to my, my partner on the project, Anuk Zomer, my, and my amazing students, Simona uh, Ziakova and Laura Font. And of course, I want to thank all of the really incredibly generous people that fund this project, and especially all of you. Uh, there is nothing that we're doing would be possible without the really mind-blowing efforts that you all do to raise money for cancer research. Uh, I mean, honestly, your support really does mean the world to us. Every time I see the links that people go to fight this disease, it makes me want to fight even harder. So thank you all so much for that. And with that, I can take any questions that anyone might have. Thank you so much for that, Spencer. That was really, really very interesting. And to uh, Will, Todd, and Rosie for uh, for your for your contributions. Um, wow, I don't really know where to start on uh, questions <laughs> questions for you, Spencer. Um, so I might just come back to that and start with a question for for um, Todd. You've been asked what your next challenge might be, Todd. Have you uh, have you got anything anything in mind? Uh, you know, it's funny. I was I was asked by another team uh, if I would row the Pacific in in May of this year, um, so next month. And and my response was, I think I would be without a fiance and without a job if if I had had agreed to that. Um, no, look, I, I I promised myself that I would spend you know three or six months not not thinking about what the next uh, event is. Um, uh, there will be something, uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. It's difficult to, to kind of contemplate what, what to do to top, um, you know, rowing across an ocean. But uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm a pretty goal oriented kind of person. So I, I, I need something to, to keep me on track and keep me focused. But uh, yeah, watch the space. I think there'll be something and, and maybe even something with, with the team or a subset of the, of, of the last 35 team. Um, so I think I'm keen to do something else um, you know, as, as a team rather than an, an individual kind of endeavor. So not a solo peddler then? 
someone has pedaled across the Atlantic before. Um, yeah, it's uh, incredible. I mean, someone has also uh, stand up paddle boarded across across the Atlantic. So yeah, I mean, there's there's some pretty uh, pretty um, creative and crazy individuals out there. Sounds it. Spencer, I've got a question about how long if, how long do you think it will be until we can see some of your work actually in the clinics? So when when we'll get reports to the Marsden, when mm. will it be spoken about there? Yeah, in publication is one thing I have control over. The, the clinic is one of those things that's unfortunately a little outside my control. But one of the things we're doing through the process of this and working with a lot of the neuro-oncologists is bringing this to their attention. Uh, we were kind of surprised that so many people really didn't think about this. Um, it was scarring was thought of as sort of a cast off uh, tissue that was sometimes not even uh, looked at. Uh, I think a lot of people we've talked to have called it um, uh, fibrous treatment effect and just sort of, you know, shuffled it away with all the other things we don't completely understand yet. So the idea is if enough uh, surgeons and oncologists really start to pay attention to this more, that maybe there are already existing treatments that they could uh, start treating patients with in conjunction with their standard of care. So I know that doesn't answer about when, it's kind of evasive on that, but uh, we hope uh, soon within the next few years, if possible. Um, so we've just had a question in the chat about what's the biggest surprise or unexpected finding of your research so far to date? Oh, I would say finding tumor cells hiding out in the scar. Um, that was something I, I really didn't expect, and it was just so consistent in all the samples that we looked at. And the fact that we saw that all the other immune cells that we're treating to try to reprogram and uh, attack these cells are kept to the outside of the scar. So this really seems like they've made themselves a, a safe little bubble. And so it, it seems at least you know, straightforward that if we can stop this from forming, that we can allow access for those immune cells uh, so that alone was a, a big surprise and pretty exciting. That sounds up. I think with that, oh, we got another one. I think it's just some comments. Ah. I think I think with that we will wrap up. We're coming towards we're coming towards the end now. Um, so I just want to say a huge thank you to all of the speakers, but um, actually everyone who's attended the webinar. It really means a huge amount. Um, and if anyone does have any questions for any of our speakers, we'd be very happy to field, field them at a later date. If you um, want to put them down in an email, then we can ensure they're distributed to the uh, to the right to the right speaker. Um, and yes, if anyone has any interest in participating in any fundraising events in the near future, then also please do get in touch. Um, and thank you very much to everyone. Great. And thank you to everyone here for all your efforts raising money. It's so impressive. Thank Thanks you. everyone. Thanks everyone.